And if you didn't have the medallion of a given firefighter brigade on your house and it was on fire, those firefighters would just, you know, ride on by because you didn't have a deal. Well, we gradually evolved a public trust for the provision of safety on that very specific level. Um, this, is, this is important. We should not go back from that and, and start saying, well, you know, why don't we put that back in the market and see what that does. Maybe it'll make it more efficient. A privatization does not mean you take a public institution and give it to some nice person. It means you take a public institution and give it to an unaccountable tyranny. Public institutions have many side benefits. Uh, for one thing, they may purposely run at a loss. They're not out for profit. They may purposely run at a loss because of the side benefits. So for example, if a public steel industry runs at a loss, it's providing cheap steel to other industries. Maybe that's a good thing. Public institutions can have a countercyclic property. So that means that they can maintain employment in periods of recession, which increases demand, which helps you get out of a recession. A private company can't do that. You know, in a recession, throw out the workforce. That's the way you make money. There are those who intend that one day everything will be owned by somebody. And we're not just talking goods here. We're talking human rights, human services, essential services for life, education, public health, social assistance, pensions housing. Um, we're also talking about um, the, 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 the survival of the planet, the areas that we, we believe are, must be maintained in the commons or under common control or we will collectively die, uh, water and air. Even in the case of air, there's been some progress. And here the idea is to say, look, we can't avoid the dumping of carbon dioxide. We can't avoid the dumping of sulfur oxides. At least we can't at the moment afford to, to stop doing that. So we're dumping a certain amount of, of stuff into the environment. So we're going to say, with the current tonnage of sulfur oxides, for example, we will say that is the limit. And we'll create permits for that amount. We'll give them to the people who've been doing the polluting. And now we will permit them to be traded. And so now, there's a price attached to polluting the environment. Now, wouldn't it be marvelous if we had one of those prices for everything? It sounds like you're advocating private ownership of every square inch of the planet. Absolutely. Every cubic foot of air, water. It sounds outlandish to say we want to have the whole universe, the whole of the Earth owned. That doesn't mean I want to have Joe Bloggs owning this square foot, but it means that you, the interests that are involved in that stream are owned by some group or by some people who have an interest in maintaining it. And that, you know, that is not such a loony idea. It's, it's in fact, the solution to a lot of these problems. <laughs> Imagine a world in which one of the things owned by a corporation was the song Happy Birthday. In fact, an AOL Time Warner subsidiary holds the copyright. In the past, it has demanded over $10,000 to allow you to hear anyone sing this popular song in a film. We didn't pay. We preferred to use the money to fly our crew to Boston and Los Angeles to bring you the following story. Five, four, three, two, one. Off into space. Man, that takes real teamwork. And here's a team of junior spacemen with an out-of-this-world breakfast. Comparing the marketing of yesteryear to the marketing of today is like comparing a BB gun to a smart bomb. It's not the same as when I was a kid, or even when the people who are young adults today were kids. It's much more sophisticated and it's much more pervasive. 
it's not that products themselves are bad or good. It's the notion of manipulating children into buying the products. In 1998, Western International Media, Century City, and Lieberman Research Worldwide conducted a study on nagging. We asked parents to keep a diary for three weeks and to record every time, you could imagine, every time their child nagged them for a product. We asked them to record when, where, and why. This study was not to help parents cope with nagging. It was to help corporations help children nag for their products more effectively. Anywhere from 20% to 40% of purchases would not have occurred unless the child had nagged their parents. That is, we found, for example, a quarter of all visits to theme parks wouldn't have occurred unless a child nagged their parents. Four out of 10 visits to places like Chuck E. Cheese would not have occurred. And any parent would understand that. You know, when I think of Chuck E. Cheese, oh my goodness, it's noise. And there's so many kids. Why would I want to spend two hours there? But if the child nags enough, you're going to go. We saw the same thing with movies, with home video, with fast food. We do have to break through this barrier where they, where they do tell us, or they say, they don't like it when their kids nag. Well, that's just a general attitude that they possess. It doesn't mean that they necessarily act upon it 100% of the time. You can manipulate consumers into wanting and therefore buying your products. It, it's a game. Children are not little adults. Their minds aren't developed. And what's happening is that marketers are playing to their developmental vulnerabilities. The advertising that children are exposed to today is honed by psychologists. It's enhanced by media technology that nobody ever thought was possible. The more insight you have about the consumer, the more creative you'll be in your communication strategies. So if that takes a psychologist, yeah, we want one of those on staff. I'm not saying that it's wrong to make things for children. You know, and I also think it's important to distinguish between psychologists who work on products for children, who help, help you know, toy cor corporations make toys that are developmentally appropriate. I think that's great. That's different from selling the toys directly to the children. The initiative is huge. I think in the US, we place about $12 billion of media time. So we'll put it on TV, we'll put it in print, we'll put it out in outdoor, we'll, we'll buy radio time. So we're the biggest buyers of advertising time and space in the U.S. and in the world. One family cannot combat an industry that spends $12 billion a year trying to get their children. They can't do it. They are tomorrow's adult consumers, so start talking with them now build that relationship when they're younger, and you've got them as an adult. Somebody asked me, Lucy, is that ethical? You're essentially manipulating these children. Well, yeah, is it ethical? I don't know. But our, our role at Initiative is to move products. And if we know you move products with a certain creative execution, placed in a certain type of media vehicle, then we've done our job. Every institution provides the people who are members of it with a social role to occupy. And typically, institutions that are vibrant and, and have a lot of power will specify that role in, in some sense as, as a list of virtues. It's true for churches, for schools, for, for any institution that, that has power over, over people and, and shapes them. One the corporation, likewise, it provides us with a list of virtues, a kind of social role, which is the good consumer. Like the waters of a mighty ocean, people also represent a tremendous force, the understanding of which is of greatest importance to the American way of life. This force is known as consumer power. The goal for the corporations is to maximize profit and market share. And they also have a goal for their target 
namely the population. 